Okay, it's absolutely brilliant for Modern Guitar Harmony to have Randy Ruse here today to talk to him about his experiences with the Mick Goodrick Almanacs and more generally about how Mick Goodrick and he connected. Um, and I th think you go back into the late 60s, you were telling me. So maybe That's we right, can yeah. start with that. Yeah, I, I was 17 when I met, met Mick. I was, it was the summer after my uh, junior year in high school and I took a seven week course at Berkeley. And uh, this is when Berkeley was just one little building and you know, it was the Berkeley School of Music. It wasn't accredited yet. And, uh, but Mick was assigned, uh, I was assigned to him as, uh, for my private lessons. And um, I had been a pretty serious uh, guitarist, but pretty strictly in the rock and blues er area. Although I did have some jazz theory, I had a, a great teacher uh, early on who, who exposed me to a lot of things that uh, ended up being really valuable. So um, when I met Mick, um, he opened the door to this universe that I didn't know existed at all. And I was, I was kind of ready for it. My um, experience at that point, uh, I played in bands a lot and I was, uh, like I say, serious blues guitarist, but, uh, but I had enough theory so that uh, when Mick started exposing me to these things, they made sense to me. And uh, I was able to embrace a lot of his uh, concepts pretty easily because I, I think my brain sort of wired a little bit similarly to his and, and uh, everything just made sense. And we hit it off uh, uh, nicely. And then I ended up studying with him for about three years after that and uh, got very deeply into his whole philosophy and uh, you know way of looking at music and uh, I loved his uh, his way of teaching too and and uh, it was uh, really a very nice relationship and then a few years after that we started playing together and uh, ended up doing quite a lot of gigs um, the uh, it's kind of cool. The Ted Curland agency that books uh, Pat Metheny and people like that, uh, based in Boston, they found that we were a really good opening act because it was two guys with uh, little amps and really easy to set up. And so uh, they used us uh, in a lot of uh, really nice concert situations, opening for uh, Oregon and Gatto Barbieri and Jim Hall and all kinds of different different things. And then we also did, uh, had a quartet with Steve Swallow on bass and uh, June Saito on drums that played um, pretty much just around Boston, but we did that for a few years, did quite a few gigs with that group. And uh, so Mick and I had some really great, um, I had great learning times with Mick and then wonderful playing times after, which was pretty incredible. I mean, he was my mentor. He, he, gave me pretty much everything I know. And then to, uh, to be playing with him in really nice musical situations uh, later was quite a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, we have a couple of recordings from that time, which you've put me onto very recently, um, Confluence and the Quartet recorded live. Mm -hmm. And you've remixed them recently. Could you say something about your remix project? Oh, well, um, the um, Confluence album came out, uh, I mean, that, the project started basically back in, uh, it was the, like 80, 1987, I think, somewhere in there, 86 maybe. And um, what had happened was uh, we, we started playing gigs in 1979, but we did a lot of duo gigs. And... Uh, Mick was really into using his old uh, Epiphone Sheridan, which he had uh, restrung and tuned down a fourth. Uh -huh. It was kind of, so therefore a baritone guitar. And uh, so uh, he would transpose charts up a fourth so that he could just read the chart and uh, be playing uh, in, in the key that I was playing in. So that, was, that worked out very well. And it was a nice texture. It was a different kind of sound. And um, we had actually done a, a radio show on, uh, at Brandeis University, which you also have. Uh, that's actually the recording that I remixed recently. Uh -huh. 
I see. And um, while we were, we, we had a great time at that gig. It was really fun. And uh, while we were driving home, uh, we were talking and uh, decided, yeah, we got to do a recording project. So that's how the Confluence album came about. And then I, I kind of lost track of it, you know, and then um, came across a copy of it. And now that we have this uh, uh, the system of the streaming services and we don't have that paradigm of having to get a great record deal and a budget with a major label and all of that to send out a release, I figured, why not just release this and... Um, got together with Mick a few summers ago and we listened to things and, and uh, also listened to the quartet uh, recording that we had and uh, both agreed, yeah, let's put it out. So that's, that's how those things reemerged. I own a recording studio. I do a lot of uh, engineering and mastering, so I'm real, I really enjoy working with audio and I was able to take some of these things and make them sound better, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, I was happy to get those things out to the world. Thank you. It's so good that you actually took the trouble to do that. It's, it's, it's a labor of love to do those kind of projects a second time around, at least. Yeah, and it really brought me back to those, uh, those great times. And uh, having lost Mick, of course, it's, it's very, uh, it, it's, it's nostalgic and very kind of heart wrenching for me now. Yeah, like, understood. understood. I think a lot of the people on the forums talking about um, their experience with mixed teaching say exactly the same thing over and over. Well, that's that's it. And um, mixed teaching was really very different from um, so many other many approaches that people take. And uh, his whole thing was never to tell anyone what to do. His approach would be to give you something really interesting, some concept, some perhaps a way of looking at a scale or a set of scales or chord voicings or rhythmic concepts, um, all kinds of things. But he would, never, he would never tell me, okay, do this for next week. He would just say, here's a thing. Go home and make music with it. Go home and create with it. Uh, he didn't tell me how to do anything. He didn't uh, specify any exercises or things like that. No technical studies ever. And uh, instead of that, just here's an area, here's an environment, go into that environment and create music with it. And don't even, his point was don't even think about practicing, just think of it as playing. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, the creative process is what's really important. And uh, and he's a funny story. Um, he was giving a clinic somewhere, and uh, someone uh, he was fielding questions, and someone asked him uh, this. He said, "You know, my playing just feels kind of mechanical and like just sort of technical studies, and you know, how how can I get it to be more musical?" So Mick Mick asked him, "Well, what do you practice?" And the fellow said. Uh, well, I do my scale drills, I do interval studies, um, I, I do uh, scales with the metronome, and uh, he went on like that, and then uh, when he finished, all Mick, said, all Mick did was just go like this. <laughs> you know? Point made. Yeah. If you practice technical stuff all the time, you're just gonna sound like you're practicing technical stuff all the time, whereas if you create, in your, your work at home that you do on your own, if you're creating all the time, then that's what you're gonna do when you're really playing out in public. Very yep. simple. And that's what takes us so strangely to the almanacs. I'm interested that, I, that's my perception of mixed teaching method from advancing guitarist onwards. And at the same time, he's produced more technical material with the almanacs and factorial rhythm. Right. than almost anyone but Carl Cherney and maybe George Van Epps. And there is so much technical material available there, yet he definitely doesn't drill you through it and he tells you to start anywhere and make music from it. Well, yeah, and, and like here, look at this. What's he say right here? Yeah, some says, assembly required. Batteries not included. Yeah. In other words, provide your own energy, right? That's and right. Assembly, lots of assembly. <laughs> so, 
you know, that's yes. Nick's, Nick's sense of humor was like that, very dry and, and um, you know, just really fun. But, but there's a lot there. There's a lot of wisdom in those two little statements there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sure, Even the word almanacs. Pardon? Even the word almanacs. Right. Instead of, it's not a method. No, no. You know, you have to make your own method. Here's the material, and, mm. and, uh, and it's really the, um, the almanacs came out of a, a really simple idea. Um, I, I remember one time during a lesson, um, Mick said something to me that uh, essentially changed my life in terms of my view of harmony. He just said, take a scale, uh, play a voicing within that scale, it could be a standard voicing or just some combination of notes, and then run that voicing through the scale. So simple. Harmonize the scale with a variety of different kinds of voicings. Um, you could start with, I mean, I could, uh, I could take triads, for instance. I could play a uh, C major scale just by, can you hear that okay? Yeah, fine. Very simple. Um, I could take a, a Dorian scale and do the same thing. So not only harmonizing a scale, a major scale for instance, or a melodic minor scale, but taking all the modes of that scale and harmonizing those too. Yeah. So, very simple idea. Um, a simple triad is a great way to start. But the almanacs um, came from what we could say is another step there. In that I just did that all parallel. Every, every chord just went up to the next one. C major, D minor, E minor, F major, and so forth. Well, that could be kind of boring. Notice it goes up. Well, what if we did the same thing but came down? Yeah. What if I started with, with C major here and then did D minor here, then E minor there, then F major, then G major, A minor, B diminished, C major. Isn't that more interesting musically? Far more. Yeah, and I could do that with uh, spread triads too. I could take a C major here, D minor, E minor, F major, and so forth that way, and, and come up with uh, something that's entirely different musically. And uh, well, then that's, that's interesting. Okay, we've taken the idea of uh, moving chords one way, but in terms of how theoretically they are, in other words, C major, D minor, E minor, that sounds like it's something moving up, but instead we're voice leading them so that they move down. Cool, there's a very simple concept. But why do we have to just run the scale up and down from one degree to the next? Suppose we pick an interval from which we will move the chords. So say we take thirds, uh, if I arrange the C major scale in thirds, okay, I take C major, then I go up a third to E minor. Go up a third, in this case a minor third, to G major, uh, up a, um, another mi a third to uh, B diminished, so forth, D minor, then F major, it's about as high as I'm going to go, but yeah, well that's cool, but again, we have one very parallel kind of movement happening. Suppose we take that idea and apply the same concept as we did before, and let's move them down instead of moving them up. So, all right, I'll start with E, uh, C major here. I'll go to E minor there. I'll go to G major, up a third from E, in other words. Up a third from G, I'll go to B diminished. Up a third from there, I'll go D minor. Up a third from there, F major. Uh, up a third from there to A minor, and that gets me back up a third to C, to C major. It sounds so much more interesting, doesn't it? Or it sounds interesting in a different way. I mean, everything sounds interesting, but, but this is a, 
a whole different uh, kind of feel that we get by doing that. It's musical. You've got common tones. You have um, something that sounds creative almost instantly rather than a sequence of a drill. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, suppose I were to do that with seventh chords instead of mm -hmm. triads. Listen how nice this can sound. If I that was that was cycle three that I was doing there, and of course you can have all kinds of different uh, intervals. You can have cycle four, five, six, seven would be moving backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Cycle two would be just moving diatonically, scale wise, if like the first thing I did. And um, are we getting too technical here? Do That's we? perfect. It's, it's really okay. useful. Yeah, right. I'm very interested in providing modern guitar harmony with an almanac 101 and i think you're yeah. definitely on that territory here it's perfect well i, I this is just like a little introduction to, yeah. the, you know, to yeah. the whole uh um wormhole that this, this yeah. concept yeah. produces yeah. you know but if you take something like if i play c major here major seven i'm just using simple drop two voicings if i go to e minor inversion uh, what would be my next one G7 yeah to B minor yeah. 7 flat 5 is that beautiful yeah. D minor listen to how this moves it's gorgeous you know, write a folk song with this you know yeah. uh, we're gonna go to F major next this has to be third inversion F major 7 really interesting sound there right uh, I get to a minor 7 next back to C major 7, but now the phrase starts again, E minor 7, isn't that gorgeous, I love it, G7, goes there, Third inversion. B minor 7 flat 5, I'm just moving one note to get there, D minor 7, get to there, um, where am I, D, F major 7, A minor 7 is next, to C major 7, but it doesn't, feels like I'm in the middle of a phrase now. Second inversion. Now the phrase is going to start again with this um, uh, G7 right there. I could end. That's, that's probably enough for now. But see how beautiful that sounds. It's, it's uh, right there. There's a song. <laughs> Agreed. Someone somewhere down the line taught James Taylor this kind of thing when he was writing his sort of 70s albums. I didn't know that. I'm sure that Pat Metheny dedicated that tune James to James Taylor. Oh, okay. Yeah, the see, bridge of James has got all of those changes in the kind of um, chorale, bar chorale style changes. I did not know that's fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's what I understand. Um, Very cool. I'm, I'm sure there was something going on with James Taylor's teaching. And this is fascinating that Mick is saying, don't be technical, be musical. And then all yeah, of this right, technique right. is bubbling under the surface. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and the James Taylor connection, isn't that interesting? Uh, a great folk artist like that, uh, singer songwriter employ, employing uh, mixed techniques. And, you know, a lot of people have a wonderful keyboard player, uh, Russ Ferranti from, um, Yellow Jackets, I was reading an inter interview with him. He got deeply into mix thing yeah. and uh, found it to be very useful. And that's, that's kind of an interesting thing because guitarists are always thought of so, being so far behind keyboard players in terms of our harmonic sensibility. And you can see that a lot. I, I think one of the big problems that guitarists uh, are limited by is playing everything in root position, having a, mm -hmm. the root of the chord on the bottom of every chord. That's that's a guarantee of bad voice leading, right? Yep. Yep. And and it go, it, it stems, I think, from the way we originally learned music. We learned chords from picture books. You know, here's a chord form, here's another chord form, and there's no real thought of how they connect. It's just, you know, we're trained to play one correct chord after another, without much uh, emphasis on on how those connections are made. And uh, whereas keyboard players, it's it's very intuitive to to voice lead uh, nicely on the keyboard because it's just laid out in front of you there. Yeah. But uh, to, to see a keyboard player go after a guitarist's uh, harmonic theory is a very interesting thing. That does not yeah. happen very often. 
Unless you're playing parallel whole tones, which irritates them. Right. You <laughs> parallel whole tone chords. They don't like them. Right. But how often do you hear a guitarist use a third inversion seventh? It's so rare. Yeah, yeah, um, true. And those are Waters some of the March by Zhao Gilberto starts with that lovely seventh chord with a seventh in the bass. Indeed, yeah. And, um, and um, you, you know, some of those, those, those wrong voicings, those voicings that, you know, in, that we're told to avoid are mm -hmm. the coolest possible things, you know. Yeah. You take a third inversion chord that has a major seven, has a flat nine interval yeah. in, in it. Yeah. You know, the most evil of all intervals, right? The last dissonance. And, and yeah, so I could, I mean, I could play a first inversion drop two and four C major seven chord, and it's, there it is, right? Yeah. And uh, drop two and four is so cool because you've got two major yep. seven inversions that have flat nine intervals in them. And that, of course, that's the next step in, in mix uh, almanacs is the idea of taking different voicing types. Mm -hmm. Drop two, drop three, drop two and four, which I just showed you. Also, the weird, the weirder ones, drop two and three. Yeah, yeah. And uh, double drop two, drop three, which is really weird. If I play C major seven that mm, way. Beautiful. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, G second I'm highest sorry. voice. That's yeah. a tough one to play. B e, B sorry C B G. C, B, G. Yeah. E. I tend to bar my little finger on that one. So I would, I would normally do the, the bar on my little finger with that one. Yeah. So you've got the... Oh, I see. You could do it that way, yeah. yeah but, so it's, it's, quite yeah, so, it's not quite in tune. Right. But we get we end up with, uh, you know, just so many possibilities when you, yeah. you have yeah. all those different voicing types. Mm. And, and um, they're not in... They're not so often taught, but they're not even on the records. These are new sounds. I know. And it's rare to hear them played on recordings even, or how does someone do that? It doesn't work by chance. George no, Van Epp said it can't be found by accident. You have to systematize it to get there. You do, but um, I think there's, there's a step that um, something that's, I think, one of the most important aspects of mixed teaching, um, which I don't think a lot of people fully get. I have tried so often with students to get them to embrace this idea but it's the idea of the guitar being organized on the single string rather than in position um, the the idea of a linear instrument like the keyboard a keyboard is fully linear all the time and uh, if the guitar is treated in a linear way that uh, leads to much better intuitive uh, kinds of voice leading. Yes. Similar to the keyboard, where it's very graphic on the keyboard. You can see how things should move. You can see what the nicest, easiest move from one voicing to another could be. Or maybe not easiest, but uh, yeah. more, more in interesting musically, we could say. Yeah. On the guitar, when we start to see the instrument not as... A bunch of shapes in position, but rather as uh, things happen sim happening simultaneously on the single string, so that you're actually referencing something on the single string rather than as part of a shape in position. That opens up the fretboard for someone um, drastically and can make uh, things much more accessible and make good harmonic um you know good good taste in harmony good kinds of harmonic decisions much more intuitive because you can see oh i can just move this to here and and not thinking chord forms i often uh, i i i've said this to people and i think i can stand by it i don't think i've ever in a long time played a gig where i have not come up with new, at least one or two or maybe a whole bunch of new voicings that I've never played before yeah. on the gig. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's a matter of being able to actually improvise harmonically instead of just regurgitating things that you've played a million times before. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the single string referencing on the fingerboard 
um, that concept uh, lends itself to that. And when someone embraces that idea, it, it in many positive ways changes their playing, opens their playing up. And for those viewers who don't know about the advancing guitarist concept, the unitar concept is what exactly. Mick called it in the advancing guitarist. Mm -hmm. um, it bears a lot of investigation. It's fascinating. Yeah, and this works, of course, not just for harmony, but for melody too, for mm. um, improvising on one string and really getting into that. It's a hard thing to get someone to do because it seems mm. so primitive and stupid, you know. It's like the, the, the thing you did probably when you first picked up yeah. the guitar. Yeah. But of course, it makes sense to do that. So that's why that's what you did when you first yeah. picked up the guitar. But you know, it's not primitive at all. Just watch Ravi Shankar. Just go to YouTube that's and nice. watch um, Ravi Shankar at Monterey Pop in what, 1967. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll see some single string playing. <laughs> yep. and, because sitar is played mostly melodically on one string. Also, the other strings, sympathetics and drones, mm -hmm. but there's really just one and maybe two melody strings, and one's used most of the time. And you, some pretty amazing single string playing yeah. goes on. Yeah, I know a bass player that calls it the elevator. You stop on floors. Yeah, and makes sense. He's, he's got that lovely mechanical movement to mm -hmm. actually stop at the the position he needs to be in for the the intervals. Yeah. And, I think maybe we got too lazy with frets. <laughs> Could be. No, maybe maybe that's yeah. part of it. Um, I'm interested in the musical side of it, the creative side. I think the, it's at the heart of all of this. Um, at the same time, we've got the opportunity to quiz you about a few things. You you mentioned um, the early days of Berkeley. Now I understand that was called Schillinger House at the time. Well, that was uh, that was quite a bit. I think before, um, Maybe, excuse me, another decade before. Yeah. 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 And I don't, yeah. I don't know too much about that. I haven't really seen the, the, uh, Schillinger system documentation. So I'm not too well versed okay. in that. An oh, okay. old friend of mine, uh, Phil DiTulio did a, uh, a, a pretty comprehensive study on that. I don't, I don't know if he released it or, but, but he did kind of a historical, uh, um, you know, project going into the history of the Schillinger system and, and uh, kind of how it developed. And I don't know if he released his material or not. But I'll chase that up. I'll not uh, bore you with it today, but I know there's some pretty heavy American composers got involved with it, such as Gershwin mm -hmm. and some of the other big names. Uh huh. Um, it might have been Woody Herman. I'm not sure. I might be wrong on that one. But there's there's a few of the big famous names were um, enthusiastic about that. I'm curious at the origins of the almanacs because there's not just the chordal side that we've discussed, but we have a melodic side as well. We've got this canonic sequencing that arises out of the chord system and those little melodic fragments that Mick calls melodic strands. Yes. And yeah. they baffled me at first. It's just the tiny little single line at the bottom of each page you can open it anywhere you get the the long sure. line at the bottom yeah and it makes sense i understand what they're doing but that little well, canonic sequence just, is fascinating he, he's basically just listing the bottom the sequence of bottom notes but of course those also become the top notes yeah yeah and they're, it just they're forms within. the kind of melodic content that that per particular sequence uh, is going to produce in terms of if you're here if you're focusing on the top note of the voicing or on the bottom note of the voicing and, which is all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so you get, uh, there's melodic content, uh, of course, when you move chord voicings around, you hear uh, a melody, uh, usually expressed by the top note of the voicing, but it could mm -hmm. be from the bottom note too. Yeah, I hear that kind of being used a lot in the Mulligan style improvisations and maybe Brookmeyer with Jim Hall. Um, I think the way they're working is perhaps from a harmonic depth that those characters have mulligan and brookmeyer both being arrangers as well mm, and um, yeah. i got a little bit hung up on the um, melodic side of the almanacs because of the fascinating chicken and egg what came first with the canonic sequencing and mm. i think I, I was cured of that a little bit by a, a book on the baroque that i was reading where 
the author said that this kind of thing drove an awful lot of the um, the minor composers crazy, thinking they'd solved everything about the mysteries of harmony because of canon. And there were some very dull canon writers. Oh. And the canonical stuff's all there, but I think perhaps it's the melody that we're talking about, the chord changes and the shifts of color with the movement between chords and the contrary motion. Sure, and, and making melodies out of the chord tones themselves. Yeah. Um, using a variety of, of different uh, chords, but uh, just using their notes as ingredients for melody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, using, um, I mean, it's, it, there's all kinds of things. And, and actually, this ties into another, um, another really important aspect of Nick's view of music. Um, what he would do, and he did this across the board with everything, is find a simple idea and derive all of the possibilities that he could possibly derive from that idea. And that's exactly what the almanacs are. It's yeah. like, okay, harmonize a scale. That's the idea. Yeah. Harmonize a scale. What a yep. simple idea. But if you look at all the ways you could do that, and of course, there are other ways beyond what Mick thought of, of course, but, mm -hmm. um, but he, he certainly thought of a lot of them. <laughs> And, and they're, uh, they're in volume three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he only explores major scale, melodic minor, and harmonic yeah. minor. There's plenty yeah. more scales. Harmonic major, for instance, yeah. beautiful scale. And, Hungarian minor. And whenever you get a scale, you also get as many modes as there are notes in that scale. So yeah. if you have a seven note scale, you actually have seven different scales. Yeah. So there's a ton of stuff. But um, Mick had a... Um, um, an approach in terms of this idea of exploring all the possible permutations of something. Uh, if you were to take a set of notes, for instance, like a dominant seven sus chord, just four notes. Mm -hmm. So if I took a C7 sus chord, C, F, a G, and B flat, those four notes, and compared them to all 12 keys, mm -hmm. I would get some very interesting possibilities. Yeah. And when you list them, uh, for instance, I could use um, C7 sus as a D flat Lydian sound. Yeah, yeah. Um, I could use C7 sus as an A seventh altered sound. Yeah. I could yeah. use C7 sus as an E seventh altered sound. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you, you learn that just by very simply just making a list. Look at look at C. Okay, the the notes of the C seven sus chord are one four five flat seven. Well, what's that against C sharp? Well, it now becomes seven three sh uh, sharp four six. Yeah, yeah. See what I mean? Works I do. for Lydian, doesn't it? Yes. So you yes. list them all out. Just take a piece of paper, take a set of notes, any set of notes that you like. Could be four note chord tones. It could be a pentatonic scale. Become so it could be some little lick you played, and compare those four or five notes, whatever, to all twelve keys. List what uh, set of de scale degrees you get from all relative to all twelve tonal centers, and you'll inevitably find some possibilities you never would have thought of. And then you go and try them out and see which ones you like. I mean, don't do the ones you don't like, but you'll find some that, that you really love. And um, just another example of how, um, I mean, Mick's quest always to find all the possibilities of things. I mean, in 10 minutes, you can take a simple idea and find half a dozen things you never would have thought of doing before that can be extremely cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.